This session is brought to you by Campbell Rinker. For nearly 30 years, Campbell Rinker has researched the opinions, attitudes, and motivational habits of nonprofit donors, including their perceptions of library philanthropy for the 2020 International Public Library Fundraising Conference. To read recent survey insights or learn more about how Campbell Rinker can serve you, visit CampbellRinker.com. Hello and welcome to Making Donors Love You More, Marketing the Impact of Your Foundation. I'm your moderator, Christina McPhillips, and I'm pleased to introduce you to our two speakers today, Jenny Jeffress and Brian Lawrence. Jenny Jeffress has been the executive director of the Madison Public Library Foundation for the past 10 years. She was the first full-time director of the foundation and has expanded the organization's fundraising capacity by 10 times. She enjoys working on board development and major gifts, and she loves capital campaigns. Previously, she worked at the Madison Children's Museum, Brooklyn's Children's Museum, and as a fundraising consultant. She is a past president of the Association of Fundraising Professionals. And Brian Lawrence leads fundraising, communications, and oversees grant-making operations at the Seattle Public Library Foundation. He joined the foundation with more than 15 years of experience with working with local and national nonprofits in areas such as major gifts, corporate relations, and communications. Before joining the nonprofit sector, he managed corporate sponsorships and television broadcasting in the motorsports industry. He holds a master's degree in nonprofit leadership from Seattle University. And with that, I'll throw it to you, Brian. Thank you. Great, thank you, Christina. And, and first of all, a huge thanks to Carl Bloom and Associates for helping to uh, organize the fundraising conference. This has been a real uh, treasure for, for the library fundraising community. We're grateful for that. And uh, Jenny, it's been great being a partner with you in, in making this presentation. Um, today, we're going to be talking about how to help uh, make donors um, love you more. Uh, for many of us, we have great relationships with our donors, but the, uh, the goal is always to increase our ability to connect with them and uh, convey powerful messages of why their support matters. So uh, we'll be covering some areas such as sort of understanding what your goals are related to um, your donor relations strategies, defining the messages that you might be delivering to your audiences, um, thinking about your audiences and how uh, you uh, understand what they know about you, how you think about what, um, uh, how you can convey uh, messages that will resonate to them. And then we'll also look at some of the platforms that are most commonly used for um, donor communications. And lastly, we'll take a look at um, uh, how we measure success and gather feedback, which is really kind of a critical part of any uh, really good development operation is to understand whether what you're doing is really resonating with your donors and uh, achieving the results that, that you would like to achieve. So the first thing that I'd like to talk about is, do you need to be a marketing expert? And clearly the answer is no. Um, but you must always think about kind of your donor and how that message, how your messaging might feel to them. How does it make them feel? Um, in terms of Jenny and I, uh, you know, our backgrounds are not marketing. So you're not getting a presentation from, uh, you know, people that have had tons of advertising experience or whatnot. The closest I came to that was, you know, putting logos on a race car and Jenny was an art history major in college. So, uh, you, you know, we are, we have learned um, by doing, but I think the thing that uh, unites us and that we share is we both have a strong belief that um, uh, the causes that we're marketing are so important to our community and our donors are so important to that work that if you truly do, uh, you know, put yourself in their shoes, you can be a successful marketer in um, kind of your uh, development operations. Um, so when I like to think about sort of considering what the goals of a marketing program are, um, I always ask myself like just a set of like four key questions. What does your audience know about you? Um, for many of our library systems, I think that um, it's universally known that libraries, you know, are about books. We have um, just great collections and people love them. Um, but for many of our organizations, there's so many things that we do that they're just not as familiar with, you know, and that can range from technology programs to 
race and social justice programs to different capital projects that we're undertaking. They're all being um, funded by, in large part, by private philanthropy. So um, I'm always asking sort of, what does our audience know about us? Um, and then I'm also asking, what do I know about my audiences? What are my donor segments? And what are my assumptions about whether they know we do this or not? And what are my assumptions about whether they get what the, the long-term impact is of the programs that we might be funding? I also think about sort of values and the alignment of values um, because that really is the key to a long-term successful relationship with any donor is do your values align with theirs and you know what is their motivation for giving and ultimately when there is that strong alignment um, there is that propensity to become uh, a lifeline donor like lifetime donor and lastly um I always think about um, whenever we're creating materials or communicating with donors, um, how will you be able to deliver a message that is repeatable? Meaning, can the donor go back to their kitchen table at night and tell their friends or family about what it is you shared with them earlier in the day? Um, because that's the key. We can um, often talk about sort of elevator speeches and the ability to sort of plant seeds, but really you have to think about what can the donor repeat? Um, and that um, is what will be uh, effective in, in driving your message home. So now I'll turn it over to um, Jenny and she'll talk a little bit about the foundation impact. Yeah, I think on your repeatable item, we were talking about, it's nice for a donor to be able to say, I give money to the library because it does X. And so I think it's really nice to create something that the donor feels like they're involved with and they wanna support. So I think when we talk about the foundation and their impact on the library, we have to start with kind of uh, what our mission is in our support for the library. So we actually have a vision in which um, we talk about, uh, you know, supporting the library so that it's a world-class library. And that's why the foundation exists and that's what we um, share with people um, in our Madison community. Um, the people that our library serves are Madison residents, but we also have programs that serve people um, in a much broader field, like we do our Wisconsin Book Festival and that serves you know, the Wisconsin community, but also now that we're doing things virtually, it actually uh, draws an international audience. But primarily we really focus on um, the Madison service that, that we provide and, and, and telling stories about uh, the people that are served by the library in our community. And then the projects, and this is also uh, pretty much uh, mission-based for us too, because we describe ourselves as supporting facilities, uh, programs and services, um, and endowment. And so that's, that's how we define kind of what we do every single year. Um, we do, uh, not everybody does capital fundraising, but we do do capital fundraising for either renovations or for building new libraries. Um, so we certainly talk about that and have a big impact on that. Uh, we have endowments for our, every single uh, neighborhood library. So we have nine um, uh, libraries in Madison and each library has an endowment. And then we certainly fund programs and services, uh, which also includes our collections. Um, and our donors, you know, from our conversations, them really love hearing about uh, collections because so many of them care about that so much. So uh, one of the things that, that Jenny and I had in common when we started playing this presentation is, is really about when you define your message um, is finding those three to five key messages that, that um, work for you and stick to them. Um, you know, when I joined the library, I was like, wow, there are so many great things that the library is doing and you could talk about them for days. Um, but I think it's really important to sort of resist that temptation to be all things to all people all the time and really to kind of try to lead with your strengths. Um, uh, we talked about this in the last bullet point about honing your message to your market, but sort of like if you look at Seattle, we have a community that really values race and social justice. Um, those are important programs to uh, the equity is becoming a uh, very much part of the donor fabric 
in our community. And, you know, the Seattle Public Library is doing really great work and has been for years. Um, and so that's become a key part of our messaging strategy is to talk about our equity work and, and illustrate that. But also recognizing that your market may be different. You know, um, I, I've lived in communities where, um, you know, race and social justice may not be the right message, but economic empowerment sure would be. Um, so it really depends on kind of what your what your market is and what your strengths of your library are. Um, I'll just comment on that a little bit further, Brian, because we were talking about, you know, what are the key areas or messages that we like to send out are the the things we fund and we fund them every single year because that's what the library needs. And so those are the messages we like to communicate to our donors. Um, we always fund something in technology. We always fund collections, whether it's print or whether it's vinyl or whether it's eBooks, but we always fund collections. We always fund professional development. And I think people like to know that their library staff are supported in becoming you know, really educated and learning new methods and learning new technology. Um, and then we have a category of kind of equity and innovation. So it, that's the other category where the projects might vary, um, but uh, that's the other category. So those are kind of the key messages that we use all the time. Um, and that's how we kind of define what we support at the foundation. And when it comes to the delivery, um, I think you really need to be focused on illustrating your message clearly. Um, we are always focused on why it benefits the donor. I, in fact, almost every single thing that we put out, um, we go back and do a read to make sure that we see donor you language in there, like your support does this. Um, it's never about we, 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 we. It's about how you are enabling um, our mission to come alive uh, in the community. Um, second point here is about jargon. Get rid of it. Um, in fact, one of the recent stories that we did talked about uh, this program we have called English Circle. And ultimately, we changed that to English classes because from a donor perspective, what is an English Circle? So our program staff gets that, um, but we wanted to be just be super clear with the, the kind of um, um, program that we are delivering the community. So um, I think a lot of library systems are very jargon heavy, so we definitely try to reduce and limit that. And lastly, you know, the, the consuming public uh, is becoming more and more uh, focused on sort of short-term Twitter-led um, uh, messaging. So short sentences, easily digestible information. Um, and uh, I always like to leave people with some tips uh, that they can go back and, and really kind of practice um, the trade with. And there are a couple of resources that I just want to highlight. These have been instrumental in, in helping me become a better development professional and a communications professional. First is a book called On Writing Well by William Zinsser. It's kind of like a classic uh, in the academic world, but I think there are some really great practical tips on here for fundraisers to, to be able to kind of create a message, go back, refine those words, um, and then produce better work. The second is How to Write a Fundraising Appeal by Mal Warwick. If you haven't seen this um, book before, it's really practical. And what I love about it is it gives you some, some of the psychological tips of why donors give. You know, some are motivated by fear, some are motivated by joy, some are motivated by guilt. And so as you even think about incorporating um, messaging into all of your different communications, you know, we're fundraisers, and ultimately one of our goals is always to get that next gift. Um, so incorporating some of these language and being aware of that psychology of why donors give can be really important to your overall strategy. And lastly, there's a, a Future Fundraising Now as a blog. Um, and again, I, I just give great practical tips every day about communications and messaging that I think um, can benefit um, your donors. Um, so Jane, I just wanted to add, Brian? Yeah. I just wanted to add to that also that, you know, uh, besides those additional resources, we have a pretty small staff at the Madison Public Library Foundation. So um, early on, I've been there almost 10 years, probably in my second year, we hired a PR and communications consultant to work with us. She works on an hourly basis and does anything from our annual report to website updates to social media. Um, so I think it's, you know, whether you have it in your capacity and can learn it or whether you need to bring in outside expertise, we certainly bring in outside expertise 
in order to make sure that once we uh, define our messages, that we have somebody helping us kind of implement that plan. Yeah, that's great. Judy, you want to talk a little bit about our audiences? Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, we when we decided to do this presentation, we really wanted to talk about communicating with your donors. You know, our priority is to retain our donors. They're very committed people. Um, and so we really want to make sure that we're communicating with them and making them, making sure that they feel really great about um, the gifts that they're giving. Uh, we also work really closely with our library on cross marketing and cross communication patterns. Um, so that if we're posting social media for the foundation that then the library is reposting, or if the library is posting things, that we repost things. So we really make sure that we're appealing to library patrons um, because those are some of uh, our most dedicated donors and or potential donors um, down the road. So we feel that's really important to us too. Um, there's a lot of book lovers in our community. I know um, we sometimes have conversations with our donors, with our board members, um, who like say things like, I'm so sorry I bought this book on Amazon. I should have gone to the library. And I'm like, I don't care where you're getting your books. I don't care. <laughs> that doesn't matter to us at all, you know, because there is like, oh, there's a wide range of how people consume information. Um, so I think whether they are dedicated library patrons or whether they're just consumers and other matters, you know, those are people who love reading, appreciate literacy, and probably have great stories about going to the library in their lifetime, which really made a difference. Um, I also just want to mention kind of the community leaders piece. Um, so many of our foundations may have an advocacy role that we play in our community, and we certainly think about our messaging in that advocacy role as well. Um, I was at a presentation for a, a statewide library association, and there was a lot of discussion, for example, of getting rid of fines. Well, oftentimes when you undertake something like that, it's usually part of that public-private partnership, or maybe it's just convincing your municipality that they need to assume uh, the revenue you get from fines. So um, I think we at, at Madison Public Library Foundation haven't had to play a huge advocacy role, but within the last year and a half, we actually had a huge turnover in our city council. So we had 15 new city council people um, join a, a crew of 20. Um, so suddenly we felt like, hmm, the foundation's name is coming up in the city finance meeting. And they're like, hey, the foundation can pay for that. Hey, the foundation can pay for that. And we're like, wait, 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 wait. Let's make sure that we really know uh, more about our community leaders, are communicating about what the foundation's goals are, the areas we fund, the areas we've uh, funded historically, so that when folks are in city meetings, um, there's no misunderstanding about what the foundation's uh, role is in our community. And then finally, kind of library staff. Again, like we do do a lot of cross communication. Uh, but we also need to make sure that library staff are really educated about um, what the foundation does. We actually do an all staff day once a year where we close libraries and bring our staff together. I don't know what that's going to look like this year, but we usually do that in September. Um, and usually the, fa the foundation funds it. We fund all staff day, but we also play a role in talking that day and kind of sharing what the foundation's been doing for the last year, the types of things we've supported, some of the projects that we've been involved with, so that if patrons ask or if somebody says, what does that foundation do? Or like, why do you have envelopes in this kiosk for gifts? Like somebody can answer that question. So I think they are the public interaction um, for so many of the people who care about libraries. So it's really important our staff um, are well informed about foundation activities and some of the key messages that we're trying to get across. That, that's so important, Jenny. I mean, I think the library staff can be some of our greatest ambassadors. Rather than being a fundraising team of 10, you can be a fundraising team of 600, 700, 200, whatever the size of your library system. So when it comes to choosing your platforms, um, you know, again, some of the key questions that we might ask are, what are your best platforms for delivering your message? I think uh, in the COVID era, that's changing quickly. Everything we have, um, you know, our traditional um, 
tools that we've used, which we'll talk about in a second, but um, the current era is focusing us or, or forcing us to move into areas that may be new or uncomfortable to us, but it's really the new generation of how we're going to be able to communicate with people. We often think about how we can consistently deliver our the message about our impact across multiple channels and using the same message over and over again, repeating that. Um, and then again, I go back to measuring success. So looking at everything that you're doing and looking at your platforms and, and asking yourself, what is the most successful at connecting with donors? And how do you determine that? So um, Jenny will walk us through some of the kind of the um, uh, different platforms that we'll, we'll, we're typically working with um, and how we measure them. So. Yeah, Brian created this great chart. So um, I'm kind of going to talk through the, the first couple items on here. And again, it's about like once you define those messages, you keep reusing them in these different platforms. You're not making something entirely different for direct mail appeal than you would put in your annual report or entirely different for your newsletter than you would put in direct mail appeal. Um, so for email appeals, um, those are some of our most successful platforms and why they're successful is because we talk to readers. So I, I think there's like something inherently important about the fact that when we send things out to our people, our people read them. Um, so our open rate and our like click through rates, I think are much higher than some average organizations. Um, I would say the email appeal we did kind of be closed for COVID-19 and kind of talking about that a little bit, I think we had something like a 35% open rate on that email, which is really high. So you can get all these statistics in terms of the measurements from your email platform. We use Razor's Edge and we use their email platform to communicate um, with our donors. Uh, but we, we do this uh, communicating with existing donors, with lax donors, um, and we kind of moving down in direct mail we do that there as well. So we uh, do direct mail by mail, and then we do direct mail, or and then we do the same appeal by email, but in a shortened format. What's been interesting about kind of moving into COVID-19 era, so we have been pushing our donors really hard to give us emails. We're just like, we can communicate so much faster on thank yous, on everything, as if you would share your emails. So we're really pushing hard on that um, as well. Uh, Brian, put we at our library don't, we only get emails for card folders that the library will give us, new emails. They won't give us addresses. Um, so we have some limitations on how we can do that. Um, but we do look at response rate. We do look at donations. We do look at kind of whether donations are going up or down um, in terms of the measurements there. The annual report is something that we pay quite a bit of attention to because it is a great place to develop stories and then repeat those stories. Um, so in our annual report, we actually do an online one only um, where we have a longer annual report and we combine it with the library. So the library and foundation do one joint annual report with their financials and we tell a lot of stories with the annual report. Ours just came out, our fiscal year ends December 31st. Um, but we also do a mini report, and we'll show a picture of that later. The mini report actually does go out by mail. It's heavy infographic material, and it's our donor list. We actually surveyed our donors to see if they cared about whether their name was in the annual report or not, and they like overwhelmingly cared <laughs> that their name was in the annual report and printed. Um, so we've continued to do that as well. But those stories are stories that then may appear in our direct mail appeals. So when we do direct post direct we focus on those same things I mentioned. We always focus on technology, we focus on collections, we focus on uh, professional development, and then we focus on equity and innovation. And we do four appeals a year and we kind of split it up in those categories. Um, news and e-news, uh, great, more timely stories in our e-news. We only do three newsletters a year. Um, so they tend to be a little bit bigger and meatier. We do a print version that's distributed in our libraries as for the new the actual newsletter. Um, and we do get great open rates and great responses for our newsletter. We actually include a gift envelope, and this will uh, uh, come up later in terms of coded envelopes, but we get good response rates even when we send out an envelope um, in, our, in our newsletters. So 
uh, it, it really gives you a good uh, sense. And, and we do get emails after like every newsletter. I probably get at least a couple emails from donors saying, I like the story or I didn't know you were doing that or something like that. So it is a great way to reach people again, because I think we have this audience who cares and reads and uh, pays attention to what we send out. It was amazing uh, prepping for this um, webinar and talking to Jenny. So many of our um, our plans are very similar, despite our systems being halfway across the country. Um, but we produce a lot of the same printed collateral material as well, such as like a grant summary document, a document uh, that that um, illustrates all the different programs that we're funding that we give to current and prospective donors. One of the things I always like to say about our print materials is they are always in draft form. Even if I have just gone to the printer with a huge run, um, whenever we connect with a donor, especially a major donor, we I always share that, hey, we, we just produced this or we're getting ready to provide this, so I'd love your feedback. And that's a great way to sort of measure whether that printed pieces is, is, can be really effective. So to me, like everything is always in draft form. Um, but it's also important, like, as you think about your stewardship calls and your phone calls and your handwritten notes, um, to think about incorporating some of your sort of key messages into those um, pieces uh, can be a really effective way to kind of, again, reinforce why the, their contribution matters and um, what you would like to uh, have them walk away learning about your organization. Events um, are a very powerful way to convey uh, your message and the impact of donor uh, visits. And we'll talk about this in the next slide, but um, we really put a lot of time into um, coming up with our event programs um, because we then use that content so often throughout the rest of the year. So uh, when it comes to um, you know sitting down with a prospective speaker of an event, if it's somebody outside your library, really taking the time to learn their and ask questions about how your message resonates with them and how the, the message impact ties in with their own experience is um, pretty, pretty powerful. Um, social media and traditional ads, um, again, with social media, it's kind of a new era where um, you know purchasing ads on Facebook and Twitter, um, the, the cost barrier tends to be very low. Um, the rewards can be significant. Sometimes it's kind of hard to judge them, but again, it depends on, on your own library system. Traditional ads in Seattle, we have a great partnership with our local newspaper, uh, and they provide us some in-kind advertising, which is uh, phenomenal. But again, you can look at clicks, shares, views, plus circulation statistics um, to really uh, understand the impact there. And then of course, press outreach. Um, I think Jenny and her team do this really well uh, for their programs in Seattle. Our library does it well from the foundation perspective. Maybe we need to kind of uh, work on growing and developing that a little bit. Um, the next slide here talks about leveraging your message. As, as Jenny mentioned, really, um, we, we like to reduce, reuse, recycle as much as we can because if you're like our system, you're a pretty small, mean team. Um, and so again, we take our event script, uh, we put that into a follow-up email, we reinforce our key messages through those emails, then we might use that in our monthly e-news, then we might use it in our fall direct mail, then it might be used in an appeal and an annual report, we might feature a quote in our case for support. We might have a web story. And then we'll share it with our library. For example, in, in an event I did in March, our library then used that story or components of that story for our library of the year application a year later. So again, taking that time to really think about how a story can be used, um, especially if it's effective and you know it's effective. You know, after our event, we heard, oh, our speaker was great. Well, then that's your cue that you can really um, use that story in all of your different channels um, throughout the rest of the year. So Jenny will walk us through um, kind of one of her plans for the, yeah. um, uh, the book. So, you know, I think I'm gonna share a plan and Brian's gonna share a plan too. Uh, but I think once you come up with your messages, you just kind of need to document um, all the different places that you're going to use your messages uh, during the course of the year. I'm sure you have a smaller advertising plan for our Wisconsin Festival, 
Um, Cause it's really specific. It talks about costs and where the money's going. It talks about getting brand messaging out there um, as well as social media. So uh, we do spend advertising dollars on our book festival and we do spend some advertising dollars on foundation events too. We use uh, Facebook ads mostly because of the narrowness by which you can define your audience. And so you can reach people who are book lovers, educated, you know, there's just like certain things you can kind of define within that. Um, also in our kind of pandemic phase right now and how we really had to shift our programming to virtual programs, this is like a brand new marketing plan. We have to kind of scrap the old one uh, because we're not having live events. And so in redefining this, we decided we were gonna do um, YouTube advertising uh, for the first time ever and, and really kind of define uh, our audience and do YouTube advertising. And I, you know, at first I was like, hmm, I don't know, my kids watch YouTube or whatever. But then like literally, I think that very day, like somebody sent me like a little clip on YouTube and had on my phone and it had the ad in front. I'm like, oh yeah, this happens a lot. It? Like we all see these, you know, even if we're not like on there thinking about it, like all the little glibs that people send us, they're all on YouTube. So um, anyway, I just think sometimes we do have to rethink. The messages are still the same. We're not changing that. Um, but I think we have to sometimes rethink some of the platforms that we use um, in the age that we're in and in the environment in which we're sharing information. Uh, so that's been kind of uh, important to me. But the messaging, again, is the same. It's just what are the platforms we choose uh, in a given time. And here's a look at this is something we're putting together right now, which is a way to, for us to map out our schools over the course of the year. Um, so this is just kind of a grid that, that we're starting to work on. And you'll see across the top we have um, some of our key messages. And again, my recommendation would be to come up with three to five. Um, messages that work for your community. You know, we think about sort of equity, education, uh, and economic empowerment as three things that are really strong at. And so we're kind of looking at how do we illustrate these key messages over the course of the year. And this this graph is probably simplified because it, your key messages might appear in you know equity might be in January. You might launch a student program in February. And I have an uh, economic uh, library business program starting in March. So it's just illustrative of sort of how you might map this out. And if you think about each of these different um, platforms and where you might use a story here and use a story here and use a story here, it might be an effective way to kind of map out your content so that, you know, you can, you can know what you're going to be focusing on and start building those stories. You can also share this with your library so that they can um, build it and feed off this as well. So now let's take a look at some examples of um, wolf, uh, donor engagement. Right, so I think back on the earlier chart, it talked about stewardship with donors and kind of using opportunities uh, as a way to communicate with donors uh, through stewardship methods. So this uh, item on the left-hand side, it's a little note card we send to what we call our loyal friends. So those are donors who've contributed uh, 10 consecutive years or more. And we do this little card to them um, in the springtime. It usually has a poem on the front, which you can't see here. Uh, so we have a, a poem from the current uh, Poet Laureate um, on the front this year. And it goes out and it says, like, you've been a donor for 15 consecutive years. And it changes for every donor. We just want them to recognize that we're paying attention. These are obviously our most likely planned giving contributors. Um, so we send them a note every single year. We also do that at Thanksgiving as a stewardship method. We figure out a Thanksgiving card. And each year, um, one of our foundation staff members puts a recipe in. So it's always a recipe in our Thanksgiving card. I can't tell you how many notes and emails we get. Like, Jenny, I tried your apple pie recipe and it was really good. And I, you know, it's, it's really, it's a different way to engage with donors. Um, and, it, you know, I think we just get really good response rates. Um, and we try to think a little bit out of cycle by doing it at Thanksgiving time. 
And the other donor engagement front, this is the mini annual report cover pages, which I uh, was mentioning to you. So we do a lot of infographics that's really clearly demonstrable here. We actually used an artist who did an artist residency as part of our maker program. So she actually did the artwork. So there's a really nice draw in from library programming to our annual report. Um, so uh, she created kind of all these icons and all this kind of statistics here, again, speak to our core messages. You know, it's like how many items were checked out, how many digital items were, were checked out, um, you know, how much money was raised through our fundraising events, how many kids participated in summer reading, which we fund, you know, so we really kind of pull out the key elements, just making sure that our donors see them, but just in this snapshot, I think, um, as we kind of evolved in our annual report uh, development, we really thought these infographics, that's what people are going to need. Um, and they may or may not get into the deeper stories online, but it's helpful to us to, again, emphasize our key messages through these very great highlight points. So, Great. And um, uh, another viewer, another approach, this is something that, this is an excerpt from our annual report um, that we produce, which is, um, I, again, similar to um, Jenny, we're going to have a combination of a printed version as well as an online version, which includes our donor names, um, et cetera. But on the left is just a letter. Um, so we did, with our annual report, we did um, kind of two different segmented mailings. For our major donors, we included a, you know, sent it via first class. We had a letter from both our board president and our um, executive, our CEO, Jama, and um, um, and these letters were, you know, heavily customized in terms of, you know, handwritten notes at the bottom of them. Um, and then in, in terms of the content of the actual report, um, you know, we featured, uh, we went from kind of small, small chunks of stories um, to more sort of in-depth profiles of, of different people. So this page here focuses on Apple, Apollonia Washington, who's one of our Raising a Reader um, daycare providers. So um, we, we focus heavily on kind of why this program impacts her, her and her students and families that she serves and sort of reduce the um, amount of sort of infographic that we, we traditionally applied. So we kind of took a different approach this year for the first time and saw um, some pretty good success. So donor so, surveys. Jenny, yeah, we're gonna talk about feedback. So I think um, we really undertook a regular plan of doing donor surveys on a regular basis, and it's really made a big difference in the kind of information we get and how we can make sure our stories are reaching people. Um, so we have kind of a, a, a set of regular questions that we ask every year. A lot of what we ask really has to do with where donors want to see their funds spent. Like, do they feel good if their funds are spent on collections? Do they feel good if their funds are spent on summer reading programs? Do they feel good if it's spent on capital costs? Um, so we really ask donors to kind of rate some of their experience uh, with where their gifts go, um, which is super helpful to us and, and helps us, you know, hone how we, how we speak to them. Um, we also ask like what things they like to read, how they like to communicate with us, uh, and, and just get feedback on, on all of that. We always ask a, a planned giving question, um, whether people have included us or are thinking of including us in their estate plan. Um, so we always ask that as well. Um, our surveys are typically anonymous, but there's a spot at the end where they can put in their name and email address. And if they do that, they get entered in a raffle uh, where they win a prize. And usually that prize is, uh, we work with Wisconsin Public Radio and it's like books and a hat and a bag, a big package from Wisconsin Public Radio. Um, but we do do that just to try to encourage people, especially those who might have said they've done a pin gift to self-identify and then we can follow up. So we do that kind of survey all the time. Uh, once a year, and sometimes we put in time specific questions like during the pandemic. Uh, we actually did a really quick survey just, uh, you know, asking people um, are using e materials, you know, any digital materials, audiobooks, downloads, things like that. And it's helpful for us to get good feedback. 
Uh, we do event surveys as well after every event that we do just to gain people's information. You know, figure we can always learn, we can always do it better. Um, so we, we are a big fan of a survey, but just a general donor survey once a year when we think people will read it. Again, they're readers, we get huge response rates. We usually get about 25% uh, return rates on our surveys. Um, which means we're getting not just a little sample, but a, a really good sample of information from our donors. And now's the time to do those because what we're hearing over and over again, record click-throughs on emails, record reading right now. So people are home, they're eager to do something. We were gonna do a donor survey later in the year and we're accelerating, moving up that effort because we know people, uh, we have a, uh, I hate to use your captive audience, but <laughs> in some ways we do. Not untrue. Not untrue. Uh, so finally, on, on marketing feedback, I think I mentioned these are some, these are like the simple things you could do. Some best practices, not going to cost you a lot of money, but information that you can can get together. Um, envelopes, whether you're doing direct mail or inserting one in your newsletter, if you know where it's coming from, you can better track the response rate. So like. Our spring appeal has one color envelope, our fall appeal has a different color envelope, our newsletter has a different color envelope than that. Sometimes when we do a specialized appeal, like for a capital project, that looks different, so we know where that's coming from. You know, and sometimes, I don't know about you, Brian, but every once in a while, I literally get something that has a logo on it that's about 10 years old. So I'm like, this person has been holding on to this envelope for 10 years. And, you know, it's like a completely different logo. So I, I think sometimes that happens too. Um, we got to talk to our stakeholders and, you know, sometimes it's surveys, but sometimes it's at events, sometimes it's at individual meetings. But I think Brian's uh, point on, you know, talking about things being drafts and getting people's feedback really gives you um, good information. Um, whether on all this kind of e-material, click-through registrations or like purchases of tickets, see what's working, what's resonating with people. We have really found that the shorter the email, the more likely the click-through happens. <laughs> um, so we've really had to kind of adjust our content to make sure that people are getting through enough just so they can click through and that's all they really need to know. Um, Brian could talk about kind of the, what's the one thing you learned? Because you kind of talked about that with your donors. Yeah, so we uh, we started putting in, for example, we did a pledge card at our luncheon, and we put just a little box on there, that, and it was recommended by a board member um, or a committee member. What is one thing you've learned from today's event? And, um, you know, you can just get, you can get single words or short sentences about um, what really resonated um, from from a program or event. So, um, it's simple and easy for the donor to do, but it can give you great feedback as well. And I think this point on trends over time is super relevant right now because as I said, we had one marketing plan when we were doing live events and now we have to have a different marketing plan when we're doing a lot more virtual events. So I think you really do have to adjust to your time period and choose platforms that work within that time period um, to make sure that you're, you're getting the message out to your people. Um, the last one is kind of the self-identified storyteller. Uh, again, when we get envelopes in uh, in the mail, you know, whether it's a little note in the memo section or a little note wrapped with a letter, you know, we get notes from kids about how many books they've checked out or we get notes from donors just saying like, I'm sending this in memory of so-and-so who loved this library and came once a week. Um, but we capture those and we reuse those um, to share with other donors because sometimes there's really great stories in there about how much people love our libraries and why they became donors. And those are the stories we want to share. Great. So, um, you know, we hope that there are, um, you know, just a couple things in today's presentations that, that you can take away um, from what we've said and help strengthen your message to your donors. Um, but the, the key parts are sort of consider your goals, um, commit to your messaging and repeat it often. Um, really think about your audiences carefully. And, and again, how it makes them feel is so critical to success. Um, thinking about your channels and your platforms and how those can help you achieve your goals. And, and finally, as Jenny just talked about, sort of measuring success and analyzing those trends over time can really, um, I think, 
inform uh, what is working for, for your organization and your shop. So um, that's it. Thank you for listening. And we are here and welcome to take your, your uh, questions. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining this, this one with us. Um, let me go ahead and unmute Brian and Jenny so that they can answer some of the questions. We've got a ton um, throughout the session. So that's fantastic. Just give me one sec. And go ahead and unmute you, Brian. You should be good. Okay, let's see really quickly. Okay, you're unmuted and Jenny. Jenny, I'm gonna go ahead and turn your video on also. Okay. All righty. We should be good now. Hopefully that worked. Okay, so let me go ahead and spotlight you two so that everybody can see you. You both look fantastic. Okay, so let's go through some of the questions. Thanks. It's amazing how much my hair has grown since between the time I you know. recorded the video and now. <laughs> well, let's go through some of these questions. You guys got quite a few, so uh, let's see. Okay, one of them was, what are some of the best ways you've learned who your donors are and their values? Do you want well, to start, Brian? Start, I, sure. Um, you know, I think that donor surveys are always critical. I think um, our foundation has done a survey about every two to three years. Um, and we also, you know, in addition to doing sort of the standalone survey, we often, um, And we had about 700 people count, count, came to that event. And then we had a, um, you know, just a box, you know, what do you learn? Or we ask questions about what are your interests? Um, and then one of the most important things we do is we make sure that whatever we, whatever information we collect from donors regarding interests, we try to tie that back to our um, database. So for example, when we, and, and even when we, um, you know, when people, uh, make a gift online and they let, maybe they choose children's programs or something like that. We tie that information back to our database so we can constantly refer to um, the donor interests and, and have a record of that. And it helps with not only just when you're talking to them, but also uh, reporting back to them on, on uh, programs that you know of are interested in. Them. Last thing I'll say is there, you know, there's so much sort of national research um, that goes into sort of libraries. Like for example, Pew Research has great resources on why people value libraries. Um, so you can use those tools to sort of generalize um, what, where people's interests are. I would just add that we used Wealth Engine, which is a service that can do kind of data analysis of your current donors. And that was helpful to us because it did give us things like ages for donors and grouped them you know, based on ages and education and some other things, and just gave us some broader analytical data on who our donors were. Um, you know, I think we always say that many of our donors are over 65. Well, it kind of proved true. So it actually was really helpful just to take kind of our, our main chunk of donors and, and, and do some physical analysis of those records to figure out who those donors were. Great. Let's see what else. Okay, so something to kind of follow that one up with is, have you used surveys to shape your donor communications in any way? I'll start with that one. Yes, we certainly have, because we always ask about um, what they read, how they read it. Um, you know, do they like their newsletter electronically? Do they like it in paper? Um, and we respond to donors specific requests based on that. If people say they, you know, only want to get the newsletter, they don't want to get appeals, for example, like we can correct their record. And so they only get one appeal a year and they won't get all the rest of them. So we respond very specifically when donors say they do or don't want certain communication, um, whether it's appeals, invitations, uh, newsletters, um, e-newses, you know, and so if people request one thing or another, we respond to that. And we absolutely ask in our surveys, like, 
what are the things you read most, you know, kind of, uh, of the different things we send you so we can like make sure that those are priorities, uh, for us as an institution. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'll add is, um, you know, when you're having conversations with donors, either, you know, pre or post event, or you're engaging with major donors, um, and maybe you're talking about a new program you're, you're, you're introducing, sort of, you know, keep in mind the reaction to it. So in, in Seattle, we launched um, some uh, new initiative for older adult programming. And um, we really were getting a lot of positive reactions from our donors whenever we would talk about that topic. And, um, you know, for our spring campaigns, we focus a little bit more on sort of the adult programs rather than um, our traditional children's programming. And, and we had a really positive campaign. So um, in addition to sort of those formal uh, surveys that you do, just keep in mind those reactions that you get from donors when you're talking one-on-one, -on -one, because I think those can provide valuable insight as well. Definitely. Okay, I'm trying to, there are a bunch of questions that I'm trying to stick with some donor-based <laughs> questions to kind of gear it in any way I can, but uh, let's see. Do you develop customized reports for mid or major donors to key projects and has that reporting yielded good results? Um, they also wanted to know about how, you know, sharing things, how, if you could talk a little bit more about how you share things in draft form with major donors. So kind of steering to major donors a little more per second. Yeah, in terms of customized reports, we do, we, we try to do a lot of that. Um, in fact, we just did, um, you know, we were looking at, we're, producing our report to donors now and we were we're kind we kind of create a sequence where we're doing some individual reports to some of our major donors followed by our report to donors followed by a live event um, called the state of the library which hopefully all three of those will sort of reinforce um, the impact of donor gifts but yeah and again tying back to sort of those interests and specifically when you have donors who have made um, restricted gifts towards a specific program um, it's in your interest to kind of, you know, respond back to them in terms of what their impact was. So uh, the reports that we get from uh, our library staff, we try to turn those around into reports that we then um, mail to donors. And then, uh, you know, I mentioned sort of everything is in draft form. I really always take a sort of a learning approach to um, anything we produce in terms of wanting to hear from donors, whether you know, the message that we're, we're trying to convey is, is being received by them in the way that we want it to. So asking for their feedback about, hey, this document, you know, would you mind uh, taking a look at it, reading over it and sending me your thoughts? And you'd be amazed at what kind of feedback um, donors are willing to provide everything from, you know, small typos in your document to major substantive changes like, oh, I really didn't understand this. So. I always think that um, if you approach a donor relationship with a with a learning mindset, um, you might be surprised at what you hear. I would just add that we also do customized reports to our major gift donors, and there's nothing like um, COVID-19 to remind you to do another one, um, because I think you know we do tend to do them maybe twice a year, um, where we tell people kind of what's going on and then we do like a final report, but you know, there's nothing like a major shift in program funding uh, to make you have to think about, okay, we need to tell people what we are doing with their money um, and how, yes, it's shifted to a virtual program or no, our bookmobile is really just providing Wi-Fi and not delivering books right now, but it's going out into the community to provide Wi-Fi. So it, you know, sometimes <laughs> opportunities are created for you to create customized reports um, but then it's just, you know, it is uh, effective that once you kind of do that, you just kind of alter it and, and can use those reports for a lot of restricted donors. Okay. Going back quickly to some surveys, we have a rec, um, we just have a request to share some of the donor surveys. I know that you can add some documents into this session specifically or elsewhere on the, on the Whova app. So if either of you are able to share anything there or anybody else who's um, watching the session right now, that would be great. Um, wondering what survey tool you've used. Did you guys mention that? We use, we use SurveyMonkey. Okay. We All just right. like provides analytics for you. So um, you don't have to kind of do stuff manually. Yes. Yeah, we've used SurveyMonkey. We also use um, a survey tool through, we've started using a survey tool through Constant Contact, mm -hmm. um, mainly because it allows us to um, 
connect who the respondent was to the survey results. So I would say um, we're generally not a huge fan of doing anonymous surveys because we want to we want to connect with that donor and understand you know how we can do better specifically in that donor's mind. Okay. And have you had any success? I think there was one about. Let's see quickly. There was a question from Lauren Arana asking about out of state surveys, I think, but that question's gone, so we'll skip. Let's see, what else, what else? Uh, what's your foundation's working relationship with the library's marketing and communications department, if any? I think Brian and had some, <laughs> some similarities in some of our experiences. So, um, I would say our marketing staff, our, the staff person for the library is also oversees all the web services for the library. So she has a job that's super split. Um, she did get to add a staff person within the last year and a half, which has been super helpful. We try to cross promote and collaborate with our library marketing team all the time. Um, you know, I think sometimes because we're a foundation and we don't have to go through kind of municipal sort of stuff, we can do things a lot faster. So there's certain times where it's like we take the lead on stuff and then they can cross promote because we can often get things done a lot faster. But we do, uh, we do work really collaboratively together. So that's a big part of what we do. And one of the things we've done is we started a um, monthly meeting with our marketing and communications divisions of the library, um, just so we can make sure that we're syncing up stories. Like, for example, one of the things we found is we have a, a, a communications manager who's a former news professional. She does a really phenomenal job of finding these like nuggets of stories within the library. And, you know, there have been a couple times where she's kind of gotten out of heaven library and done a story about, you know, the curiosity cabinet on the 11th floor and the marketing people all of a sudden get emails about where's the curiosity cabinet. So I think that coordination is really important. And the other thing is, um, you know, with our library, they've got such a huge job in terms of marketing, uh, you know, promotion of events, wayfinding, signage, um, just so many internal functions of the library, whereas we're a little bit more focused on, how do we show the impact of library programs on people? So where, you know, sometimes they're really focused on keeping things, you know, honoring privacy where we're really focused on, we want people to be able to see another human being and how they um, maybe benefit or use libraries programs. So I think the relationship can be really positive if you um, kind of both identify your lanes and work together as much as possible. Okay, and I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, does the foundation have their own social media platforms or do you push from the library itself? I think it, this kind of relates to the last question. We each have our own social media platforms because oftentimes we're promoting our events that are fundraising events or uh, we, we do some educational talks around planned giving for our donors, for example. So oftentimes, you know, what we're promoting is, is more specific to the foundation's needs and asks. We also do a lot of our, um, you know, appeal sort of stuff uh, through our social media. And then, like I said, we do do Facebook ads um, and through our Wisconsin Beck Festival, we do YouTube ads too. So um, I think we do our own. And again, we cross promote though with the library. So if the library tells like a story about curbside pickup, like we cross promote that on our social media too. So we use as an opportunity to uh, collaborate with the library and do both. And the same same holds true in Seattle. We 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 try to amplify their social media, and then we're um, uh, we're especially specific when we would like them to amplify our social media, such as like when we're running a spring or fall campaign. So it's all about um, you know being uh, being good partners, and um, you know we always say our story is their story. Um, so the more that we can collaborate, the better we'll all be. Well, I think that's about all the time we have left for Q&A today, but Brian and Jenny, thank you both so much for all of your time. Um, if anybody has any additional questions, I know there are probably a few that we didn't get to just yet, so we may direct those to our speakers. Thank you again. Hi, everybody. So thank you, Katie. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.